Chapter 3. Decentralized Pronomianism Since time immemorial, theological and political battles have raged over the foundational cleavage between antinomianism and pronomianism. The shared root is nomos, an ancient Greek term that roughly means law, or more generally our human contrived socio-symbolic structures. Leftism is correlated with antinomianism. To the leftist, status quo symbolic structures are arbitrary and rooted in past injustices, so they deserve to be denigrated, righteously violated, and overwritten by the organized masses. Pronomianism is conservative. To the conservative, property ownership and contracts should and must be respected. To the antinomian, the pronomian's obsessive fidelity to past agreements is reactionary. Deleuze was a leftist insofar as he wanted to see power over property and contracts more equally distributed and decentralized. But this is a widespread preference, so it's not very interesting. More interesting is how little this revolutionary philosopher espoused the antinomian politics fashionable at the time. From militant protest, to overthrowing traditional family structures, to the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist kidnappings and bombings and airplane hijackings, very common in the 1970s. He is known to have signed a few petitions, but in such a radical and mobilized milieu as his, signing a few petitions indicates a curious detachment. In my view, Deleuze's political behavior looks like an overwhelmingly disinterested person doing the bare minimum to not flagrantly insult his punch-drunk peer group. Not to mention that petitions are a rather pronomian political behavior, seeking a change to the nomos, but by respecting the protocols of the nomos. Although Deleuze wanted to see power equally distributed, the shockingly under-recognized fact is that Deleuze was a radical pronomian. He was obsessed with the social technology of contracts, and especially their creative and liberatory potential. Consider the following from his interview with the much more antinomian theorist and militant Antonio Negri. Quote, I was initially more interested in law than politics. Even with Masik and Saad, what I liked was the thoroughly twisted conception of contracts in Masik and of institutions in Saad, as these came out in relation to sexuality. And in the present day, I see Francois Ewald's work to reestablish a philosophy of law as quite fundamental. What interests me isn't the law or laws, the former being an empty notion the latter uncritical notions, nor even law or rights, but jurisprudence. It's jurisprudence, ultimately, that creates law, and we mustn't go on leaving this to judges. Writers ought to read law reports rather than the civil code. People are already thinking about establishing a system of law for modern biology, but everything in modern biology and the new situations it creates, the new courses of events it makes possible, is a matter for jurisprudence. We don't need an ethical committee of supposedly well-qualified wise men, but user groups. This is where we move from law into politics. End quote. As Moldbug notes, antinomianism supplies a crucial adaptive morbidity to the contagious and highly successful memeplex of secular progressivism, technically the most recent atheist mutation of Protestantism, exemplified by Richard Dawkins' replacement of the God delusion, with a mystical zeitgeist of liberal progress. A majority will find it highly attractive to remove all hard constraints on resource transfers, though such a non-principle is also doomed to destroy any system. If law is not sacred, resources can be transferred from anyone to anyone else at any time, according to any principle that is fashionable or favored by those with power. It turns out, therefore, No intelligent and honest leftist can consciously endorse pure antinomianism, for antinomianism will ultimately reflect the Thrasymachian position that, quote, might equals right. Instead, modern leftists since Marx somewhat consciously opt for an instrumentally justified dishonesty, publicly moralize about the evils of unbridled domination, tell everyone that, quote unquote, might does not equal right, but organize the masses precisely on the claim that their might will make right. 
This also explains why most Marxist revolutions become fascist in the end, for their practical logic is based on a contradictory, mobilizing shell game. Antinomian before taking power, pronomian after taking power. In the end, one realizes that the most perfect antinomianism is capitalism. The meaning of any word whatsoever can be changed overnight, with enough entrepreneurial creativity. All that is solid melts into air, as Marx put it. It would seem to follow that a consistent and honest leftism requires at least some component of reactionary pronomianism, but before the revolution. This is how we will understand Deleuze's seemingly strange interest in law and contracts. To explain what I mean, we must first take a detour down the road of sexual pathology, for it is on questions of sexual pathology that Deleuze first cuts his teeth on the question of jurisprudence. In the book Coldness and Cruelty, a book about the concept of sadomasochism, Deleuze ultimately rejects the idea that sadism and masochism are two poles of one dimension. Through philosophical readings of Marquis de Sade and Leopold von Sacher Masek, Deleuze argues that a masochist will never be fully satisfied with a sadist as his torturer, and a sadist cannot maximize his pleasure on a willing masochist. Whereas masochism is all about law and contracts, the sadist hates contracts. In short, sadism is antinomian and masochism is pronomian. The preferred political vehicle for the antinomian progressive is the norm or institution, whereas the preferred political vehicle for the pronomian is the contract. Following the French revolutionary saint Jus, the Marquis de Sade explicitly favored a radical institutionalism that would have done with all laws. Deleuze explicates the political coordinates of institutions versus contracts perfectly in the following passage, which deserves to be quoted at length. Quote, the juridical distinction between contract and institution is well known. The contract presupposes in principle the free consent of the contracting parties and determines between them a system of reciprocal rights and duties. It cannot affect a third party and is valid for a limited period. Institutions, by contrast, determine a long-term state of affairs which is both involuntary and inalienable. It establishes a power or an authority which takes effect against a third party. But even more significant is the difference between the contract and the institution with respect to what is known as a law. The contract actually generates a law, even if this law oversteps and contravenes the conditions which made it possible. The institution is of a very different order in that it tends to render laws unnecessary to replace the system of rights and duties by a dynamic model of action, authority, and power. saint Ju accordingly demanded that there should be many institutions and few laws, and proclaimed that the republic could not be a republic so long as laws had the supremacy over institutions. In short, the specific impulse underlying the contract is toward the creation of a law, even if in the end the law should take over and impose its authority upon the contract itself, whereas the corresponding impulse at work in the case of the institution is toward the degradation of all laws and the establishment of a superior power that sets itself above them. End quote. Though coldness and cruelty maintains a neutral analytical tone befitting a professional philosopher, it is easy to see that masochism is more neatly aligned with Deleuze's own worldview and character. Sadism points upward toward a, quote, transcendent higher principle, end quote, ironically demonstrating the cruelty inherent in Enlightenment rationality. Masochism instead points downward toward an imminent diversion of rationality's cruelty, which humorously converts its oppression into pleasure by applying it to oneself with a, quote, excess of zeal. Sadism is more compressed and hurried whereas masochism is drawn out and relies on waiting. Remember that slowness is privileged in Deleuze's works with Guattari as a way of going fast. And as Reynolds points out, Deleuze especially admired writers such as Beckett and Proust, both of whom are known for a masochistic sense of time. Reynolds even argues that, broadly speaking, analytic philosophy tends toward sadism and continental philosophy tends toward masochism. In short, Everything suggests that, if we wish to draw out a Deleuzean politics of law, 
we should look to Masek contra Saad. When Delos tells Negri he is interested in, quote, user groups generating their own jurisprudence, he is clearly signaling his affinity with Masek rather than Saad. He is not asking that we let loose unconstrained authority and power via informal institutions. Quote, we don't need an ethical committee of supposedly well-qualified wise men, end quote. Rather, he is suggesting that autonomous groups should begin to generate their own law with defined parameters, free consent, no imposition on third parties, etc. And what we find in masochism is that individuals and small groups can adopt seemingly reactionary and oppressive technologies, law, contracts, punishments, as a pathway to liberating revolutionary potential. The masochist seeks to create a novel, sustainable, and collectively empowering combination of cold masculine rationality with warm maternal compassion through political ingenuity. Quote, the trinity of the masochistic dream is summed up in the words cold maternal severe, icy sentimental cruel, end quote. Masochism does not suppress or brutalize feelings, but is rather a disavowal of quotidian sensuality in favor of a superior and more durable sensuality. Quote, Under the cold remains a supersensual sentimentality buried under the ice and protected by fur. This sentimentality radiates in turn through the ice as the generative principle of new order, a specific wrath and a specific cruelty. The coldness is both protective milieu and medium, cocoon and vehicle. It protects supersensual sentimentality as inner life and expresses it as external order, as wrath and severity. End quote. This structure of thought and behavior is familiar. Just as masochism generates pleasure by practicing pain, Christianity deepens life by renouncing the things of this world. The tendency of masochism is to imitate Christ, to become, as Masoch wrote in a letter to his brother, man on the cross who knows no sexual love, no property, no fatherland, no cause, no work. It was in this Deleuzian Christian spirit that I first proposed my vision for a neo-feudal techno-communism. Neo-feudal techno-communism achieves collective freedom through a voluntary and delimited fascism over oneself. It's a peaceful, sustainable model of communism based on historically unprecedented technologies for the production and maintenance of collective commitments. Namely, quote-unquote, smart contracts, automated and irreversible contracts written with code on a blockchain, and increasingly ubiquitous passive monitoring hardware, i.e., the Internet of Things. Deleuze's insights from masochism will be especially useful in this regard if I am correct that the contemporary left is suffering from a short-circuiting of hyper-compassion. The left today is all maternal, all sentimental. No analytical coldness or icy honesty is permitted, even if a most severe glacier of gynocratic slave morality nonetheless emerges as a return of the repressed. Deleuze helps us to see what is needed. Creative, pronomial assertion. A rectification of names, not against the left, but from the left and within the left. Applications of rationality icy enough to generate novel, autonomous political orders, which are imperceptible and impenetrable to the representatives of status quo institutions. A divine latency that equalizes distributions of warmth and resources through the ascetic renunciation of superficial warmth, fake equality, pagan sensuality, and sadistic sensuality. Indeed, the matter has now become surprisingly concrete in the form of the blockchain. As pure contractual imminence, cryptocurrencies running on distributed ledgers portend new reactionary left paths to autonomous communism. With the same paradoxical structure as masochism and Christianity, crypto portends an exit from capitalism but only for those who voluntarily accelerate its capitalist logic. Deleuze would have been delighted.